All right, now we're recording. We're recording, okay. It is 7.02, we will call the HRB meeting to order. And first question is, are there any public comment cards in your possession? There are not at this time. Right, we have, uh, we have no public comments. Uh, so we will move directly into public hearings. Tonight we have two public hearings on the agenda. The first one is GLU 20-00007, HR 20-04. We will open that public hearing with the required statement. The criteria for approval of a land use action are contained in Chapter 17 of the Oregon City Municipal Code. The proposed development must comply with applicable provisions contained in the Oregon City Comprehensive Plan. Generally, unless otherwise is noted, if a request is found to be consistent with the municipal code, it is considered consistent with the comprehensive plan. If you wish to participate in this hearing, including challenges for bias or conflict of interest, you must complete uh, the sign-in form located on the table uh, at the front of the meeting room and deliver it to staff. Please do so immediately. The chair will only recognize those who have submitted completed forms. Testimony will be taken in the following order. First, the applicant. Second, any testimony in support of the applicant. Third, testimony in opposition. And fourth, rebuttal by the applicant. When recognized by the chair, please come forward to the podium, give your name, address, and make your statement. All testimony, arguments, and evidence presented regarding this request must be directed toward the applicable criteria or other criteria in the planned or land plan or land use regulation which the person believes to apply to the decision. Please address only the applicable criteria for the decision. Please do not repeat testimony. If you wish, you may choose merely to agree with the previous speaker's statement. An issue which may be the basis for an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals shall be raised not later than the close of the record at or following the final evidentiary hearing. Such issues shall be raised and accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the Commission and the parties an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision makers and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of persons to participate in the public hearing either orally or in writing precludes that person's right of appeal to the city council or LUBA. Written testimony submitted prior to the hearing constitutes participation in the hearing. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the decision maker to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Prior to the conclusion of the initial evidentiary hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony regarding the application. The Commission shall grant such request by continuing the public hearing pursuant to the standards contained in ORS 197.763. Do any of the board members have conflict of interest or ex parte contact regarding this application? No. No. No, uh, but I would like to disclose that both myself and the applicant uh, are subject to a maintenance agreement for the pavement in the 
uh, Hedges Street right away between 4th and 5th Avenue. Okay, and I want to make the uh, statement that I've made before. My wife and I are both licensed real estate brokers in Oregon, and in that capacity, we assist members of the public in the purchase and sale of residential properties, including some in the Kenema and uh, McLaughlin districts. Uh, and this property is not currently on the market, and selling it is not any part of this discussion, so there is no conflict of interest in that. Regarding ex parte uh, contact, as stated at the last meeting, we discussed this at the Neighborhood Association meeting back when we could have things like that. Um, I think it was in February. Uh, I recused myself from that discussion, but was present throughout. So has everybody visited the site? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, does anyone in the uh, vast viewing audience wish to uh, challenge or comment on conflict of interest or ex parte statements by board members? None. Okay. So we move to HR 20-04. We'll start with a staff report. All right, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Basinger. Uh, my name is Christina Robertson Gardner. I'm a senior planner with Oregon City and we're getting the PowerPoint presentation up. And here we go. This is a staff presentation of HR 2004, which is a new single family detached home and detached garage in the Kanema National Register District. Uh, this evening, we have some items to enter into the record. There's a public comment from Chrissy Geis, a neighbor in the, the Kanema neighborhood, as well as an email from Chair John McLaughlin, who, would not, who could not make it this evening, and I wanna read out his comments. Uh, they were sent to you, but I wanna read it out loud for the record, one second. Uh, these are um, regarding this application. He says, HR 20-04, I'm fine with the way it looks. The fact that they are choosing Leland Cypress for the front plantings will help them mitigate the size. They are a fast growing evergreen that will soften the front. The size now is fine and will work better for the site. They've done what I think is the best they can while trying to appease the guidelines. So that portion of his email dated May 22nd has been added to the record, as well as public comments from Chrissy Geis. One uh, additional uh, clarification I wanna add to the record. On page 20 of the staff report, there was a grammatical error. It initially said that there should be an emphasis of the horizontal versus, uh, emphasis of the horizontal versus the vernacular, and when in fact it should say vertical. So the design should have an emphasis on the horizontal versus the vertical. So please add that to the record to clarify. The applicant has the 120 day deadline for this application as recall at the last meeting, it was extended to June 20th. So the stork review board is required to make a decision this evening or uh, request that the applicant extend the 120 day date. Next slide. Oh, I can do this, Never mind. Thank you. So the options the board has this evening, uh, you have uh, option to deny the application to request the applicant provide a 120 day extension to August 6th and return at June 23rd, hearing with revised drawings as directed by the board. Approve the application as conditioned in the staff report. And number four, approve the application with revised conditions. And I've identified two conditions, number seven and number 14, that I think comprise the majority of deliberations this evening. Uh, staff has uh, provided denial findings within the staff report that they, the board can utilize or supplement. However, if the board wishes to move forward with approval, uh, staff requests that in the deliberations uh, and potentially even part of the motion uh, that the board provide additional uh, findings for approval. 
Uh, just to provide an overview, once again, this is located at the uh, corner of Fourth and Hedges. This is a 10,000 square foot lot in the Kanema National Register District. Uh, the uh, site is also in a geologic hazard review. The applicant has applied for a geologic hazard review, which is a type two staff review. It is currently incomplete and they're waiting for the final plans as approved by the board before they complete that application and notice for their geologic hazard review. Uh, here's some street view right at the corner of Fourth and Hedges looking up to the site. You'll notice, uh, I know as part of the applicant's presentation and probably as part of your deliberation is this discussion of the upslope uh, of the lot kind of at a cross uh, slope intersection. This is at Fourth Avenue looking up. Uh, some, there are some adjacent houses to the site, both historic and non-historic. Uh, we do have a tree preservation and removal requirements, and those are uh, embedded into the existing conditions of approval about providing uh, the minimum removal of trees. The applicant uh, subsequent to the April meeting has submitted revised plans. Uh, I'll provide some brief overview and the applicant can provide more detail. The applicant in the revised plans you'll notice provides uh, planting of the Leland Cypress, uh, which you can see on the plans, uh, further uh, providing kind of fast growing uh, tree shade towards the view corridor. Instead of providing uh, a side steps up to the porch on 4th Avenue, the applicant has provided an alternative approach, which is a new kind of rear side elevation entrance uh, right along the driveway at Hedges Street. And you can see that right around here. So this is where that new side entrance is. And these are where the Leland Cypresses are. The applicant has not, uh, in the revised plans, kept the east elevation with at grade. Uh, though the west elevation, um, you would now have that new, uh, the, both the bump out and the new uh, porch addition. So that will play into one of the conditions of approval of the final approved width. Uh, this is the revised entryway. You'll notice there was a discussion at the April meeting about turning the lower basement elevation into looking more of exactly what that is, a basement. So kind of smaller basement windows, some siding, and what looks like concrete, but I'll ask confirmation from the applicant, as well as a new kind of service door um, to the rear, uh, right behind that tree. See, right now the gable is still open, so there is still a condition of approval with closing that gable, as well as having uh, either full or half light doors on this uh, second, the, the kind of second story or ground floor elevation. So that'll be further in your discussions about how you wanna approach those doors. Uh, this is the revised side elevation. Oh, excuse me, this is the revised, this is the uh, rear elevation, excuse me. This is, you're looking at the driveway, looking at the rear of the house. This is the east elevation. So this has not changed since the initial submittal. So this is re-included for reference. And once again, this area right here shows the at grade bump out. This is the floor plan, uh, once again, with the revised porch. And here we are with the uh, revised west elevation with the kind of what would traditionally be kind of the rear uh, side entry in the back with some stairs up. Uh, and it looks like these, I'll have the applicant further explain if these are metal railings or wood railings. So the conditions of approval haven't changed from the last meeting, but really I think most of the deliberation will be with condition approval number seven, which initially was the recommendation to continue to have the front elevation uh, be the fourth avenue elevation close the gable, use a single entry door on the main floor of the north elevation and connect that porch uh, through the use of a side stair. So the applicant has chosen in lieu of a side stair to do the new uh, kind of side entrance 
Uh, but I think the three other items should be further discussed by the board. Uh, how to approach the doors on that porch elevation, as well as the um, closing the gable. Uh, finally, number 14, uh, initially staff recommended a maximum uh, width of 37 feet at grade. So that would have changed the um, east elevation that was uh, uh, at grade to be uh, cantilevered if it were removed uh, or an alternate is approved by the board. So it looks like with the new, uh, I'm gonna move back for a second, with the new site plan showing the side elevation, uh, what that, uh, what the actual width is considered, that can be a conversation with the board and uh, I'll work with you as staff to figure out how that condition should be written to further um, uh, refine or are you, if you want to accept the application as proposed, you can uh, just identify that in a staff report that the, uh, this is approved with the revised May plans. I'm gonna go back to the conditions of approval. Once again, number seven and 14, I think are the ones that are gonna have primarily most of the deliberations on. Uh, what I did notice, what was missing uh, was our standard discussion about lap siding being smooth cement board or wood. And as this is a bungalow, it can be either four or six inch uh, reveal. And then uh, number 20, it talks about, which goes back a little bit to the condition approval number seven, about the doors on the front facade either being half light or solid. So depending on what number seven is, number 20 can be revised in this conversation. Uh, so once again, your uh, options are to um, deny the application, request an extension or approve. Um, oh, excuse me, that was the last one. I'm gonna go back to the, that was an old slide, I apologize. I'm gonna go back to the beginning of the presentation. Uh, your options are deny, request an extension, approve as conditioned, or approve with revised conditions after de deliberation. So I'm available for any questions the board has, and I know the applicant is ready to present as well to give a little background of how they got to the revised plans based on listening to public comment as well as the direction of the board at the last meeting. Okay, thank you. We'll now call the uh, applicants. See your microphones are still turned off. We're getting it, just a second. Okay. Uh, real, real quick before that, Christina, could you yeah. speak to, um, is there a, a setback preservation incentive being requested? Let's see. On the side, on towards the Hedges Street right away, is that? Yeah, let's go to that. Oh. I'll have to take a look at the fans, um, and I'll be back to you in just a second, Grant. My eyes are not good enough. I need to zoom in. Why don't we, um, is it all right if I do a little work and then uh, while the applicant's speaking and I can respond back? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, can um, it be turned on to vote? Um, I, I hear you now, yes. Well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Uh, I just want to hear your comments on it. I read Mr. Robinson's comments uh, in the material provided, and uh, I think the board would be particularly interested in anything that you have to say about the conditions of approval number seven and 14 that Christina just brought up when she was giving the staff report. Hey, uh, I'll just can I say a couple of things quickly. Yeah. Hear me? 
Okay. Um, the the elevations, the east and south elevations uh, that were just presented a couple minutes ago are the older ones. It's not. There's not a huge difference on them. I don't think that's where the significant concern is. Out that those look slightly different now. Um, he emphasized the entry door on the south side. Um, and then, um, and then I think that's it for now. Mila, if you want to talk about what uh, you want to talk about. I just wanted to say that um, we met with Christina, um, or we spoke with Christina a couple of times on the phone, and um, Bo was able to um, connect with her as well to um, work further on um, all of the things um, you guys wanted us to change um, since last meeting. And I wanted to emphasize that um, I understand there was a big concern with covering the basement and uh, making it more look like a basement. So I, um, we decided to um, build a, like a, you could see that on some of the industrial buildings where there's like a cage with uh, greenery that goes uh, and kind of uh, covers the um, main level, and it could be uh, fake or real that just um, grows to um, make it more look like greenery rather than um, a structure. That's what the um, green area is on the drawings. Um, and um, That is, oh, I also wanted to emphasize that this is um, sixth time we're coming back to you guys with um, trying to make this work and um, trying to um, make everybody happy. And um, in two years, this is our sixth time. Um, Yes, that's all I had to say. Well, Mila, I uh, appreciate the hard work that you obviously put into it in the last month. The, the, that's very evident in the changes in the drawings. And I uh, personally think that we're very close right now. So again, I, I appreciate the work that uh, you and your architect have done on this. Thank you. Does any board move? member has have a question yeah i've got a couple i guess so on the north elevation and i guess the west elevation on the, the, the basement portion the nine sided part is con just kind of exposed concrete behind there like I said, the plan is to um, have exposed concrete with um, that caging with, um, I originally wanted real greenery um, just going and, and covering it. Um, you can obviously buy a mature plant to from the beginning, so it, it looks um, like there's greenery versus pure concrete showing from the, from the, uh, you know, from the street. Um, and to add to that, so, and I honestly can't remember the reason at the moment is why one side has all concrete and no siding, and then the north side has partial um, concrete up to the bottom of the windows and then siding. Um, there's some logic behind that. <laughs> It's escaping me at the moment, but Mila kind of explained the, the, the concept there. And I think I would say in, in respect to those particular issues, I think we are really open to um, some, you know, uh, coming to a kind of collaborative um, agreement on what is the best way to sort of mitigate that. You know, we can't make it invisible, but we can try uh, um, to, I, I think I'm on board for the concept of trying to make that seem a little bit more like a cellar basement. I mean, you can't because it's actually all the way out of the ground, but maybe by doing that, kind of almost creating a window well effect in a sense that sort of puts more emphasis on the, the areas above that that space. And I and I love the idea of the, uh, basically the metal trellis work with 
that seems fitting, you know, historically. I, I, aesthetically, I like it. Yeah, I, I agree. I like, um, I like what you did on the north elevation uh, and then putting uh, some greenery on top of that to kind of further, I, I think that's- Oh, great. I'm sorry. Now I remembered. I knew that nothing was gonna grow under that deck. So that's why I didn't put the trellis work on the north side, so. Yeah, okay. And then, so now that the north elevation is this a side of the house rather than the front, um, do you have any comments on, uh, so at least in one of the public comments and in Ken's comments from last meeting, discussed taking the gable um, out of the, uh, the, the porch roof there on the, what would be the north elevation? Are you opposed to that or in favor of that? Taking it out altogether. Um, or, I, I would um, want to actually see what it looked like to make sure it doesn't um, sort of elongate the building or, or, or make it feel taller, I guess, is the only concern I'd have. And I'm not sure if that would be the case, but I just want to see it. But, um, and then Mia, of course, that's, that's your home, so I'm not sure how, you, you know, we could, the only problem is, too, is that it's a little deeper because of the gable, which gives them an outdoor space, you know, to, 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 to furnish a little bit and stuff. So um, um, if we were to take the gable away, we would lose that, that extra depth, in a sense. Um, but um, what do you think, Mila? I think I like the gable. Okay. So we would just close it and not have the... Uh, we can still vault it, but we just wouldn't have the, the open gable with the with the, the beams there. We've lost your sound. Oh, can you hear me? I can now. Okay, maybe I was mumbling. Um, <laughs> um, I think that if we we were to keep it and take away the uh, the vault, you know, the open gable aspect of it, and um, so that it's not as prominent of a feature, uh, still give them the extra space. That would be ideal, I think, for their their function. Okay. Uh Regarding the doors uh, out onto the deck, uh, I'll get to you in a second, Claire, okay? Okay. Um, it was pointed out last meeting that uh, double doors are really not a thing in Kanema. And I say that living in one of the very few houses that does have double doors. So, uh, but I had nothing to do with it. It was already that way when we bought the house. Um, and the other two houses in Kanema that have double doors were both built before the historic guidelines ever took effect. They date back into the 1940s in one case and the 1970s in the other. So double doors in Kanema generally are just not done. Um, yes, uh, I gave Christina a photograph of mm. the best example of a bungalow house in Kanema, and I don't know if she has. That I can photo get that there. up. Just a second, Ken. Hey, can I comment or? Sure. Okay. Um, yes, that, I, I, here's a, a suggestion I would have. Um, again, I don't know if that, that sight, uh, line of sight diagram I did kind of showing how much you got to crank your neck to even see those doors from degree. Um, but um, with, with that being said, um, Mila, and this is obviously something, um, you know, it's more about your pat living pattern and everything, but I think aesthetically, I would actually like to see windows there that maybe even a little bit wider, and it seems like that would match architecturally and kind of historically. And then maybe just 
a single door on the side wall that goes into the, the breakfast room. Um, so you wouldn't even see a door at all from, well, I mean, you know, it may be slightly, but on that side wall as opposed to open to that? Yes. Okay. If we, yeah, get the bigger windows instead of the doors, then yes. So I think that would solve that. I think it would really actually look, um, you know, if whatever you're going to see from, I think it would, you know, match more seeing the top, the top half of, you know, single hung windows there as opposed to the double doors, the full light double doors there. So. Let's ask Claire what uh, your question was. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, you know, on the gable ends. I think that they, um, you know, have not the, the, the cross pieces. Nope. Was oh, that the picture that you submitted? Yes, it is. Oh. Uh, and that would, it's, it's not exactly a classic bungalow, but it is the best example of a bungalow in Kanema. And you can see the uh, full width porch, the generally symmetrical layout, and, and all of those things you're good with. Uh, but you also see the single door in the, in the center. And I don't remember what the width of this is. I'm pretty sure it's around 30 feet. So it's a little smaller than what you're talking about. Oh, that's really nice. This is an authentic 1917 construction. Uh, um, here's one thought is I'm looking at now that when everything changed, uh, you know, this thing is more as time has gone on. Um, we could just make, we, we could not do the gable and do the shed that we have there a little bit deeper because I wouldn't mind if the lower pitch portion of the shed actually went up closer to the bottom side of the windows of that upper level anyways, instead of having the intersection kind of below them. And we could sort of kill two birds with one stone. We could get the extra depth there uh, for use and, um, and and but then potentially eliminate the, the gable if you think that you want to emphasize the other side more just feeling more like the side in a sense well you had the the deck itself kicks out a little bit beneath the gable right uh, yeah and that would mean that your your roof edge would have to correspondingly extend further, wouldn't it? Well, right. So there's about the able conceals that. Yeah, there's about a two foot difference between the shed portion of the porch and the gable portion. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is maybe a kind of a compromise would be to actually link the deepen the, the shed porch, well, maybe not quite out to where the gable is, but uh, close to that. Um, and not have the gable, but get the extra depth all the way across the porch. Way to, if, if we feel like the gable, I, I mean, I personally have the gable, but if that's a concern, we could um, just keep the function for them by uh, just uh, deepening the, um, the shed portion of the porch and not having the gable at all, basically. I, to me, it kind of breaks up a really long roof, but um, and I think it helps keep it feeling like it's, I think the gable actually keeps it from feeling wider in a sense, because that long roof um, on the porch to me, it just makes it feel wider by not having it broken up, I guess, but visually. But it also accents the, um, the horizontal, where with the gable, it, it kind of accents accentuates the vertical. It takes your eye up. Yeah, yeah. That, no, it's uh, definitely thought-provoking. I just, it's so hard without having a three-dimensional uh, <laughs> uh, kind of view of it because of the, that, the, how much 
you're, you're looking up at this to begin with, um, from 4th Street anyways, um, you're thinking about how, the, how what that will be like, you know, from way down below. I suppose we're kind of looking at it straight on. Um, On a staff level, I do have a comment back to uh, HRB members, Blythe's question about setbacks, if this is a good time. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so the R6 zone has a 10 foot corner side setback and the covered porch is nine feet, seven inches. So it's about five inches uh, too short. So the applicant can shift the house, they can slightly reduce the um, the depth of the porch. There's lots of options that the applicant have. To get a preservation incentive, we actually have to notice it. And I checked back at the uh, February notice for the meeting and it didn't include that their preservation incentive was being requested. So it can't be approved tonight. Uh, it could be approved through a separate application, through a continued application and re-notice, or the applicant can shift the house to make it work within the underlying zones. Um, for some reason, we had a 15 foot setback there going way back. Um, and if it is 10, then we're so close that we could um, just make that go away one way or the other. Um, but I just want to verify that, that we're not incorrect on the, on the setback because we were told, I think we were told it was 15. Uh, I'm double checking right now with the R10, R6 zone. I think because it was what type of street it was potentially. Um, That's a corner. So a, a corner for the R6 zone is 10 feet. And it may well, be that, that you may be that the initial conversations happened before our, our code changes. And so we've had some code changes this year that further reduce the setback. Uh, so my recommendation is uh, just to put additional condition of approval that uh, just requires the applicant to modify the porch or shift the house to meet the underlying zone setbacks. So we're only four inches yeah. away from that now, right? Uh, you're, okay. yeah. Five. Yeah. Five. Oh, you're five, but yes, yeah. <laughs> you're very close. So it's an easy condition to add. And you will work up some wording on that, Christina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can only do math until about two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, I get one last question. Um, the columns from the elevations were super clear. Are they are they rounded or are they square? And do you have a preference? Are they of what you want? Square is definitely the design concept. Um, we were told kind of early in the process to keep them fairly simple. So basically, um, uh, larger, you know, because we don't want them to look spindly, um, but we're very basic and just with a pretty standard uh, cap and base um, that uh, the, the Kanema bungalow style would not have ornate uh, columns with uh, large bases or tapered tops or anything like that. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, I, I think that's fine. I, I just, I don't think round is very typical of a bungalow and, but you right. can't so much tell from the elevation. So. Uh, yeah, it almost has that appearance for some reason. I agree. <laughs> um, and speaking of that same subject, I do have a question on the, what, we're, what I'm sort of deeming that the front porch, which is off hedges, is would it be appropriate to screen under the porch with the same siding as the house or to leave it open underneath? In my head, for some reason, it seems like a bungalow would have a siding under that, um, but maybe I'm incorrect. I mean, I, th I think siding would be consistent with the other homes that are right around there that have under their front. Front, front, front edge of the deck. I think so, yeah. Uh, it's the, uh, that seems like, 
the way to go to me, but on the bear. And this is on what elevation? Uh, it would be the west on hedges. Gotcha. Yeah, to me it should be, I would think, you know, landscape screen or sighting. Question for staff on that. If you do that, does that then add to your 37 foot dimension on the width? Well, um, it, I think that's a question the board's going to have to make because as proposed, the staff's initial recommendation of 37 feet at grade, this plan doesn't meet. So the board's gonna have to deliberate if they wanna move forward with the plan as proposed, they could remove that, the, that condition, just accept the plan as proposed, that's one option. And if you wanna revise the plan, you could put that revision in. But if you're feeling comfortable with the plan as proposed, we can remove that condition and just accept the revised drawings. Uh, the one other option you can do for the um, under porch is we often have kind of a some options the applicant can do, um, you know, historically appropriate lattice, siding, you could give a couple options. So that's another idea. Okay. A quick question there. So with the, with the, um, the, the patio, the porch, whatever, um, how wide is it then? Um, what's the depth of that yeah, uh, approximate uh, 15 15 feet. Uh, five, no, they, five feet deep five foot deep so it would be 37 five, 22 or excuse me 42 wide Which, let's see, we would be hanging, yeah, I guess, because that's cantilever, we're hanging that off a cantilever, aren't we? So, um, hmm. so you would, if we did that, if we did siding, um, we'd have to kind of run it all the way back to the foundation just for that area. The one thing I wondered though, visually, because you can see that it's open at the, from the deck level up, couldn't give the impression of being part of the foundation because you know, you're seeing it as a porch area. As a porch. But I, I think that is definitely a concern. And I was just gonna ask, so this, it should be meeting 37 feet at grade, correct? It's strong. Uh, the east elevation wasn't meeting it because. Right, because that's a, I, I maybe I didn't supply you with the, the new one. I, I'm not sure. I, I, cause we do, I do, there is an updated east elevation that shows it all cantilevered. Okay, well, if if, uh, if if you feel as the applicant, you can meet the condition, which is 37 feet on grade, and maybe the board can make a revision to the side porch, that can be a condition and that can just be reflected in the plans that staff reviews. Um, yes, there is. Go ahead. If you have it really quickly, you can email it to me and I can add it to the hearing right now. So if you on, want. on your screen right there, that little basement level that's being cut, partially cut off shows that bottom level, the, the width of that foundation of the building at 37 feet. That's it. So well, that's good. That, that's certainly the intention. So the east elevation okay. drawings, um, would uh, show a cantilever? Yes, yeah, and I, I'm pretty, I thought I did a PDF yeah, of that. I didn't I get it. Um, but yes, that's the intention is to, because I thought, you know, I definitely was trying to meet that requirement was 
that the, the base of the building is going to be no wider than 37. And I, I think what would probably look the best would be off for that porch off of hedges to actually side or, or lattice, whatever seems appropriate, and actually extend that. Maybe lattice would be better because it wouldn't seem like a solid surface. Um, and then extend that to the actual foundation just to keep it kind of clean um, and not to have too many different things going on. And if we did more of a or maybe we could even, yeah, sorry. Well, I think lattice is one um, application that I think would fit, you know, as long as it was the um, square and not the, um, what do you call it, the? Diamond. <laughs> yeah, 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 not the diamond shape, but the square, right? The square, yeah. not, the, not, the, not the diagonal. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't think it, I think we just put it in the conditions as at the discretion of the applicant. I, mm -hmm. think fine. I don't I agree. Okay. okay. Um, if there are no further questions for the applicants, then I would ask if there are any members of the public prepared to speak for or against the uh, application as submitted. None? Okay, in that case, then I'd like to close the public hearing and move into deliberations on this. I'm going to get the slide up with the two recommended conditions of approval just to help you to see if 7 and 14 need to be removed or revised. Um, you can let me know and I will type it in. But Laura can get up. It's um, page 16 and 17 of the presentation. Okay, so let's go to 16 first. And then we'll go one more. Okay. So um, conditions of approval number seven and 14 are there. If the board wants to have conversations. Uh, I wasn't catching everything because I was looking at the setback. So I know there was uh, discussions about the doors and the gable and maybe an alignment. And, and so that might be a good deliberation as well as um, kind of a final discussion about the 37 feet at grade. And, and um, my recommendation would be uh, then to also add the, uh, the porch as proposed um, for number 14. The board wants to have discussion about condition approval number seven. Yeah, on number seven, I think that we can uh, delete the last clause of that sentence because we're not going to connect the front porch to the ground. We're going to use this, the side entry instead. Yeah, so it's not the start by deleting that. So, did we decide are we removing the gable or keeping the gable? And are we, is this entrance moving to the dining, the breakfast area instead of in the center? Or, well, I put a lot of stock in what our architect had to say, and uh, he was satisfied with the gable being there as long as it was enclosed rather than open. And I, I think that that is called for in one of the other conditions here. Oh yeah, close the gables. Gable, yeah. yeah. Which condition is that? Why don't, perhaps maybe we can either 
we can leave them the option to either remove the gable or close the gable, depending on what they decide. They want to mock it up both ways and make a decision. Um, okay. I think my I would be okay with it either way. Uh, one of the uh, comments from uh, from from a neighbor, Chrissy. Uh, darn it, I don't have. The name. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, she expressed a similar opinion. She she thought, yeah, I would probably like it better without the gable, but she would be okay with the gable enclosed. So I like I like your suggestion, Grant, that uh, we give the applicant the uh, flexibility to choose one or the other. What do you think, Claire? Great. Um, I like having the option of either or. Yeah, I, I, can, I can live with that. And then the single door can either be centered or moved to the. And then we, it's and it's going to be a half window, right? On the door, yeah. It's it's not going to be a full height window. Okay. okay. I had a question that, on. That, yeah, that one is uh, number twenty. Number twenty. So it's on. Oh, okay. Solid or half? Okay. So regarding condition 14, it sounds to me like the applicant has taken care of that by cantilevering the uh, portions on the east elevation to uh, keep it 37 feet at ground level. And so when it's cantilevered, it doesn't count toward even the, because it's kind of levered, it doesn't, it, it's doesn't, that, count it's that the, that doesn't count toward the at grade dimension. At okay. grade dimension. Yeah, and I'm, so maybe I'm, we'll, we'll be the, the holdout here, but as far as the east elevation, I don't actually think that I mind so much if the foundation did extend out there and that little bit where the sink is and, or no, I guess, what is that in there? But regardless, on the east elevation, if the foundation went out further, I don't, to keep kind of the bungalow form, you know, the, the narrower it gets, the more, the, you know, the more vertical it looks. Um, so I guess I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the way it is. Um, You're okay with the way it was uh, drawn? Yeah, I don't want it any narrower than it is already because okay. I think it would look too narrow then and, and tall relative to its height. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree on that mm -hmm. point. That, that yeah, because you want that verticality, or excuse me, the horizontally. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. A lot of what? Um, so I had noted two additional conditions of approval that were not stated here and, and regarding the setback, um, we want a condition that affirms that that uh, west elevation setback is consistent with mm -hmm. code. Chair Basinger, I have a proposed condition of approval number 26 to add. Okay. It says that the applicant shall revise the porch and house or house design to reduce the width five inches to meet the underlying zone side yard setback. So it kind of gives the applicant full reign to find where they want to take their five inches. Okay. Everybody happy with that one? Yes. Uh, and then I think you, Christina, mentioned something, you, the standard siding uh, condition. Mm -hmm. Number 15, you can see that there, it just been revised. So back to seven though, I, uh, 14, 
One thing uh, may, that may be worth to add to 14 is just a confirmation. I'm hearing two things, two confirmations. One, is there um, a clear direction from the board that the applicant does not have to have the east elevation at grade? And B, confirmation that the board approves the uh, porch as proposed with the following, you can provide options for, if you want to, of the uh, uh, under part of the porch, what kind of material should be used. What's the, what's the last of, one? Underside of the porch is easy. We just uh, say lattice that's consistent with code. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, yeah, uh, lattice or siding for the, yeah. And I guess the question is confirmation that there is clear direction about the east elevation cantilevered versus at grade. And I will, based on that, I'll come up with the revised condition number 14. Okay, uh, Grant, I, I heard you vote for uh, at grade and I will add mine to that. Ray, Claire, what do you guys say? I can live with that grade. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so go ahead and write it up that way, Christina. And I think we are ready for a motion here. Okay, um, just give me one second. I need to figure out what I'm writing. I need a haircut. <laughs> Second, I'm almost there. Wow. <laughs> I've got my hat on. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been wearing a hat a lot more than I normally do. I've been giving myself my own haircuts, but the uh, problem is beard. <laughs> if I go in and get a haircut, I can't even get a beard trim. They don't uh, won't allow it until at least phase two. Oh, really? Yeah, because you had uh, oh. all barbers, you had to, you're required to wear a oh. face mask. Oh. Uh, well, Christina's pulling that up. Sorry, one last question, guys, for the deliber deliberations here. Uh, since we added the new gable on the west elevation, should that be closed? If they if they keep the gable on the north elevation and that's closed, should the west gable be closed on the porch to match? Good point. They should match, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I and I lean more t and I lean more toward close gable on the on that west elevation. So the porch should be revised to have a closed gable as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, on the west side. Yeah. Okay, almost there. Okay, this is my revised condition approval 14. The applicant shall reduce the full width of the porch to be a maximum 37 feet at grade. The west elevation bump, sorry, the east elevation bump out may be allowed at grade or cantilevered. The porch proposed in the May revised plan is allowed and shall be revised to show a closed gable with siding or with lap siding or square wood lattice beneath as cover. I'll say that again. 
the applicant shall reduce the full width of the porch to be a maximum of 37 feet at grade. The east elevation bump out may be allowed at grade or cantilevered. The porch proposed at the, I'll do the, the side porch proposed in the May revised plan is allowed and shall be revised to show a closed gable with siding, a lap siding or square wood lattice beneath. Board, let me know if I captured everything. I think you did. Okay, so the revised conditions you can have in your motion, revised condition number, you don't have to name them, but these are the revised conditions. Number seven, it says the applicant shall modify the entryway to remove or close the gable on the 4th Avenue elevation. The one I just read, number 14, uh, the clarification that uh, smooth lap siding can be four or six inches or wood uh, confirmation of 20 that the doors on the 4th Avenue, not street, wrong neighborhood, 4th Avenue elevation shall be solid or half light. And finally, condition number 26, the applicant shall revise the porch or ha and house or house to reduce the width five inches to meet the underlying zone side yard setback. And as part of this, um, real quickly, um, I know there was a lot of technical uh, discussion, but um, before you make your motion, um, some general deliberation findings of why, as conditioned, this uh, proposal is compatible uh, massing-wise with the uh, Kenema National Register District and why these conditions have done to reduce the massing would be helpful in the record. So if this does get appealed, the City Commission understands kind of what your thought processes were that got you to the place where you are here with your proposed conditions related to compatibility and massing. Sure, sure. I think that uh, the reduction in the width of that front facade from where we were, which I think was 42 mm -hmm. or 44 mm -hmm. feet, uh, has reduced the massing considerably um, and the more modest appearance tends to uh, eliminate that that dominance that the, the house would have had in the neighborhood and I think it's a really good compromise that we've we've arrived at here. Yeah, I tend to agree. Yeah, I, I would concur with maybe adding something that, you know, reducing the width while still trying to maintain the kind of essential proportions of the bungalow style. Yes. Are we ready for a motion? I, I Just before we do that, sure. there was one other condition that we talked about that didn't get written mm. in, and that's the columns. They sure. should be square, not round. Okay, I wonder if there's one we can modify. I can just add number 26, 27. So the applicant shall propose square, the applicant shall revise the plans to uh, indicate square rather than round columns. On well, I don't think they ever were round, but uh, square is what they should be for okay. sure. So the applicant shall Columns on all elevations. Okay, so number 27, uh, the applicant shall revise the plans to show square columns on all elevations. Okay. I would entertain a motion now. 
So there was there's five that you called out. Uh, I mean, the ones that yeah. we were considering, correct? You, you can, I think you can say uh, as re revised as previously discussed is fine. Okay, I I gotta get the number. Ah. HR twenty oh four. Oh, okay. I thought there was a GLU. <laughs> so, yes, there is that. There is. Um, I move that we approve twenty dash oh four with the conditions as previously discussed, um, one through twenty seven. Mm -hmm. Second that motion. All right. Very good. Shall we pull the board? Sure. Uh, HRB member Stoby. Aye. HRB member Blythe. Aye. HRB member Matt. Aye. Acting Chair Basinger. Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Well, that's the first for me. I've never done one of these on Zoom since I wasn't part of the meeting last time. <laughs> okay, well, now while we uh, change over, I, I don't know, Christina, will the applicants be coming in for uh, item 3B? They are actually here this evening in person. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you, Bo, Bo and Nella. Nila. Good luck. While you're okay. doing that, I need to go move, remove all the squeaky toys from my dog's <laughs> box of tricks. I'll be right back. Anybody want to take a two minute break oh. while we reboot for item 3B?
Okay, everybody, are we set to go? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to resume the, we reopen the public hearing here on item number G, uh, 3B on the agenda, GLU 20-0005. Uh, HR 2001 and I'll ask staff for an opinion. Do we need to reread the? Uh, we do because our um, applicants were not in the room at the time of the first meeting, which is the one problem with Zoom meetings is we have to read it every time. Okay. Okay. Uh, we now commence the public hearing on agenda item HR 20-01. Uh, a request for approval of a live work structure uh, in the McLaughlin Conservation District on 5th Street. Uh, the criteria for approval of a land use action are contained in Chapter 17 of the Oregon City Municipal Code. The proposed development must comply with applicable uh, provisions contained in the City of Oregon City Comprehensive Plan. Generally, unless otherwise noted, if a request is found to be consistent with the Municipal Code, it is considered consistent with the Comprehensive Plan. If you wish to participate in this hearing, including challenges for bias or conflict of interest, you must complete the sign-in form located on the tablet on the table in, at the front of the room and deliver it to staff. Please do so immediately. The chair will only recognize those who have submitted complete forms. Testimony will be taken in the following order. First, the applicant. Second, testimony in favor. Third, testimony in opposition. And fourth, rebuttal by the applicant. When recognized by the chair, please come forward to the podium, give your name, address, and make your statement. All testimony, arguments, and evidence presented regarding this request must be directed toward the applicable criteria or any other criteria in the plan or land use regulation which the person believes to apply to the decision. Please address only the applicable criteria for the decision. Please do not repeat testimony. If you wish, you may choose merely to agree with the previous speaker's statement. An issue which may be the basis for an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals shall be raised not later than the close of the record at or following the final evidentiary hearing. Such issues shall be raised and accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the commission and the parties an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision makers and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of persons to participate in the public hearing, either orally or in writing, precludes that person's right of appeal to the City Council or LUBA. Written testimony submitted prior to the hearing constitutes participation in the hearing. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the decision maker to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Prior to the conclusion of the initial evidentiary hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony regarding the application. Commission shall grant such a request by continuing the public hearing pursuant to the standards contained in ORS 197.763. Do any board members have a conflict of interest or ex parte contact regarding this application? No.
Did everybody speak there? And I will repeat what I said before. My wife and I are licensed Oregon real estate brokers. And in that capacity, we assist buyers and sellers of residential property in Oregon City and surrounding areas, including Laughlin and Kanema districts. This property is not on the market. We have never been involved with it in any way, and there is no conflict of interest. Has everybody visited the site? I have. I have. Player is silent. Oh, sorry, I, was, I, I didn't know that I had it on, on mute. Okay, does anybody from the audience wish to provide comment or challenge a conflict of interest or ex parte contact statement regarding this application? If not, we will proceed then to the staff report. All right. Thank you, Acting Chair Basinger. This is HR 2001, which is a historic review for a new live work unit in the McLaughlin Conservation District. Uh, I'd like to enter into the record this evening, uh, the email from John McLaughlin, who was also in the last application, and an email from John Delson. The email from John, uh, John McLaughlin, I'll read it into the record. Um, let me get it right here. He writes for HR 2001, it is better, but still feels top heavy on the upper roof level. Historic district fringe zone or not, it still applies. I'm definitely not a fan of a third party letter from Jessica Ingman as a hired outsider for their cause. I would go with what the majority of the board feels. This is his comments. Uh, Mr. Uh, Delson's email relates to retaining walls and I have a recommended revised condition of approval that may um, address this question. So let me go back to the presentation. Uh, your options this evening, oops. All right, my, my clicker isn't communicating. Computer, where would you mind? Oh, maybe it is now. So your options this evening uh, to deny the application. To request the applicant provide a 120 day extension to September 6 if you need any additional revisions or to approve the revised plans as submitted with conditions and make an additional finding that the board can determine that the revised plans provide sufficient mitigation for the design and massing of the building and there are sufficient findings to show that the garage cannot be relocated to the side or rear of the building without substantial regrading of the site. Um, as always, uh, more findings are better in this situation. Uh, we are learning as applic applications get appealed to the city commission, they really are interested in learning about how the stroke review board made their determination and how uh, the revised conditions really uh, provided the findings they need to show compatibility. So just a couple slides uh, to reorientate yourself. This is on Fifth Street in the McLaughlin Conservation District. Uh, it, uh, it abuts John Adams, which is an unbuilt right of way, which is a path leading up to um, our Waterbird Park. This shows the site location and topography. This is zone MUC1. Uh, this property and the property next door uh, are kind of on their own, but they are really only uh, two blocks away from the 7th Street corridor. Uh, this is also in the geologic hazard overlay district. The site slopes and you can see the contours. Uh, it's down sloping, so the far corner is the highest port of the property. Uh, this will also go through a geologic hazard review as well as a site plan and design review for live work. Um, the, I, I provided an additional um, staff memo um, that provided a little more um, a background on what the live work use is. It's a use that was adopted um, in our code uh, after the design guidelines for new construction were uh, approved in 2006. And then they were further 
um, added onto across the city in our recent equitable housing code update. So it is kind of a hybrid use that is not per permitted in the uh, residential zonings unless through conditional use for the medium density residential and is allowed in our commercial districts, but with a requirement for um, a specific amount of commercial space. So it's really not um, a single family house or a commercial. It's kind of a, a an other, a third uh, definition. And so uh, let me know uh, during uh, questions if you have any uh, questions about that staff memo that tried to kind of provide more of a zoning planning look at that use. There's also additional requirements through site plan design review the applicant will make, need to make uh, as part of their site plan design review requirements. These include parking uh, and other uh, size review requirements for the commercial space. Uh, here we are looking at Fifth Street, looking up the street past the uh, 1960s low horizontal um, building and the Property is just behind that building. Here's showing kind of right where the unbuilt John Adams is, right at Fifth Street. So this is the top part of the property. Uh, there are some adjacent historic resources um, to your left. And then I, we added the 909 Washington Street, which is kind of Oregon City's uh, McLaughlin Conservation District's prime example of a four square. And this is on Washington Street, a little farther uh, down the street. Uh, the applicant provided some revised plans um, that are in your packet, and I know he will uh, go over them, but the kind of the, the major uh, revision that I see is, he, is an attempt to look at a way to uh, provide separation from the garage and the main volume, but also still utilizing uh, the garage and left elevation as the retaining wall into the hillside slope. And I think that's the crux of the discussion is uh, detaching the garage does make it a lot more complicated in the geologic hazard review and uh, how to design that retaining wall. Is it on its own or is it built into the, uh, the design of that, that elevation? So this, you can see that there is about a three foot, eight inch separation till uh, you get to kind of the, almost to the, the end of the garage, but it, it clearly separates the garage out visually from the, um, the front part of the uh, four square main body of the house. This shows the revised uh, plans. This is the revised side elevation. So this is the downhill. This is what you're looking at when you look up the hill. Uh, and this is the elevation closest to the 1960s Guild Mortgage Building. This is the rear elevation. And this is the uh, left elevation, uh, which is uh, the elevation that's kind of into the hillside and that discussion about um, how best to design the garage. Uh, in a further slide, I'll look, show the conditions of approval, but my recommendation is to revise the conditions of approval if there needs to be any additional retaining walls that they cannot be taller than six feet, especially any area related to in front of the garage doors to the um, kind of front of the uh, fifth. Sometimes with the elevation, you need to provide a retaining wall kind of from the garage to the street and uh, just refine, referring the, what the, the maximum height would be allowed and that gives them direction as they go through the geologic hazard review. This is a revised perspective. You can kind of see that uh, separation between the garage and the house and that front part. Uh, so as with the last meeting, kind of have two questions I think the board needs to answer with their additional findings if this application as condition can be approved this evening. Um, and looking at has the applicant uh, reduced the massing uh, enough to be compatible with the district, knowing that this is not a single family house and this is not a traditional commercial house like an office or multifamily, but it is a live work use, which is kind of a hybrid or a, a different use. So uh, how do you view this use as it relates to massing? That's kind of question number one. Uh, question number two, garage location. Uh, given the site slope, the garage has been pushed back. Is the revised plan sufficient? 
uh, and has the applicant provided su sufficient findings to show that the garage could not be relocated without substantial regrading. Uh, the board has made this finding in two other situations in Kanema, the green application and the BICE line as it related to a, um, a steeply sloped uh, lot that, however, is more of a single family house, whereas if a commercial use, you wouldn't necessarily have an attached garage. But once again, this live work use is kind of a, a, a third use. It's neither single family or commercial. So it'd be good for the board to have that conversation about how you see that as it relates to both massing and garage. Uh, we have proposed conditions of approval that are based on the revised plans. Um, one recommendation I would have, I'm gonna go to Condition of approval number six that talks about the materials of any uh, retaining wall. This is a great place to add um, any further descriptions about the maximum height, be it related to the garage or not. So I have a potential proposed uh, uh, condition refinement that says all retaining walls associated with the garage and the left elevation shall be no more than six feet tall, all other uh, all other retaining walls shall be no taller than three feet. So that's one option. We can let the, see what the applicant and the board thinks about that, but that condition makes the most sense. Condition number six to be the one that is revised to uh, further clarify retaining walls on site when they're not associated with the actual structure of the house. So once again, uh, kind of your options this evening is to, uh, oh, that was the previous one, I apologize, um, is to, I'm gonna go back to the front slide, is to deny the application, request um, an extension to provide, have the applicant provide additional revisions or approve the revised plans with conditions, be it revised or not, um, with the additional findings about massing and the garage location. So I'm available to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Christina. Any comments, board members? Questions for uh, staff? If there are no questions, then we will call the applicants and hear what they have to say. My name is uh, John Delson. Welcome back. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, John Delson with uh, Delson Engineering Inc. I'm based from um, Vancouver, Washington. And um, since the last time we did hear the concerns from the board about the location of the garage and the um, height of the building or the massing of the building. So we listened to these concerns and we provided a number of uh, revisions after uh, consulting with uh, city staff and listening to recommendation and also consulting with independent um, uh, historic uh, pr preservation specialist, uh, Jessica Ingelman. So we proposed a few changes to the plans uh, and I would like to explain a little bit more about the location of the garage as we understand it's, it's prime concern. So in front of the garage, I would like to ask the staff maybe show the site plan and also the front isometric elevation. And so in front, uh, to keep it going, in front of the garage on the left side, we do have um, need for a retaining wall and we can, we can provide this retaining wall. Uh, this is at the bottom of the screen below this arrow, blue arrow, and we can uh, do a smooth concrete finish, concrete retaining wall, not more than six feet high. And the wall will keep going, must keep going uh, up the hill, and this will be the left side of the garage. So as we know, um, there's no need for windows over there or living space and then following up crawl space, but the crawl space will be lifted and we will try to follow the natural grade of the, uh, of the site to minimize the excavation and minimize the retaining wall 
because our understanding is that the geotechnical engineer from the city uh, would not recommend the retaining walls to be higher than eight feet, even in the part of the building. And the best solution is to use the retaining wall in conjunction with concrete slab placed on the ground. So this is typically used in engineering to st stabilize the wall and um, increase the factor of safety for sliding. So this uh, concrete wall in front of the garage, of course, we need because even if we go 15% up on the driveway, we still may end up under six feet of retaining and then following up in the garage. Okay, so uh, the driveway uh, concrete also will support the wall and likewise the garage uh, concrete slab on grade will prevent the wall from sliding. Uh, this solution was presented at the preliminary meeting with the city staff and was accepted by, uh, by uh, city staff, a geotechnical engineer. Uh, so based on this, we resolved the other issues and commercial studio um, has been placed in front of the building facing the street. This is also one of the city uh, planning and zoning requirement. And this is the only living space we can afford at the ground level. Um, on the left side, we have 10 foot setback from the property line. And this is, I understand the minimum setback. Although theoretically we can go from property to property using commercial zoning. However, at this particular site has a limitation of 10 feet setback on the left from uh, JQ Adams. And on the right side, we left about six feet of space between the building and the property line. This will be used later by civil engineer uh, to provide uh, stormwater management. So we, uh, we cannot, for example, create a driveway or hard surface in previous area, in previous surface. Uh, this side of the building will be used for detention um, facility. Okay, so uh, this retaining wall and the geotechnical uh, situation and the shape of the lot and the sloping condition dictate the, um, the way to, uh, to manage the, uh, uh, the uh, slope and to retain, um, retain the dirt and minimize the excavation. Now, the second concern was about the massing. Uh, so we cut the building on the back. Uh, we cut, we eliminated one bedroom, one bathroom on the back of the building. We reshaped the building, we squeezed the building and provided the um, three feet something separation, uh, visual separation from the building. Um, and also instead of a single 16 feet wide garage door, we introduced two smaller door doors. Um, the other thing, we, we also worked on the uh, elevation and lowered the roof. Uh, currently, according to city standards, uh, the elevation is calculated from the um, average grade from the front elevation to the mid portion of the roof. And as we see, this, this height on the average from average grade height to the mid portion of the roof is below 30 feet. Um, I don't know if the board has any questions, but otherwise I would like to thank everybody for the, um, for, um, for participation. And we would like to ask uh, your opinion and we appreciate understanding and cooperation in this, in this situation. And also would like to introduce um, Ms. Jessica Ingelman, uh, she was serving for about 20 years um, in historic preservation as a historic preservation specialist on the City of Portland Landmark Commission. And she would like to add her opinion as well uh, to the record. So unless there are hey, any questions for <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Sorry, I, are there questions for John? Okay, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, maybe first to address Mr. Uh, McLaughlin's comment uh, earlier. I just wanna say that I'm, I'm a friendly voice here that the applicant brought me on uh, to, to help articulate their position, to participate in this, um, that if you have further questions or comments that perhaps having someone um, that's knowledgeable in the historic preservation field 
would be beneficial to have um, with them as they move through this process. Um, so I'm sure you both, uh, you, you all took a look at my letter, uh, provided a few comments. They asked me to particularly take a look at um, the massing and the garage and, and provide my thoughts there. Um, I am familiar with the site. Um, I did some graduate work in Oregon City. Um, and so I sort of looked at this from the approach of compatibility and looking at the types of historic resources you have and seeing that this particular uh, property is at the edge of the district where that density and that consistency of the pattern of the historic resources isn't quite as, um, as robust, leaving perhaps an opportunity for a little more flexibility given the um, constraints of the slope site as well as the program achievements that they're trying to make with the commercial use here. Um, so I thought their approach was sort of doing a, a, the Craftsman Foursquare, which is a building type, obviously, that um, you know, has a little bit more, you know, can handle the, uh, the larger square footage in its, its architectural presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think at the district edge that the massing in terms of particularly looking at that front facade and that side facade, um, that, that from my perspective, it didn't seem completely um, out of character with the district, especially since you weren't balancing it with two smaller homes on either side. And then with respect to the garage, I mean, that, I understand how tricky that is, that you have a pattern in a district with um, detached garages. Again, looking at this particular site, um, it seemed like it wasn't um, as obtrusive on the district having a change in that pattern where um, you did not have that adjacency issue of other historic resources sort of setting the tone. Um, and the other thing is that to a certain extent, um, I, I feel like in historic preservation, we always have to balance the, how much do we make it look like a, a historic resource in the district versus sort of acknowledging that it is a modern building with, with modern program requirements. And I agree that it, it's a challenge here. Uh, just from my, my personal take on it, um, I realize you're the ones that ultimately have to, to decide what meets the guidelines, um, is that sort of forcing that garage to be detached um, uh, in, in terms of a, a spacing, which I think what they've done is um, certainly a nod in the right direction. I actually like the fact that they've um, broken up the the garage doors. I feel like that helps um, change the scale a bit more. But in terms of trying to push that to the back of the site and ultimately having really large retaining walls is both a real uh, financial feasibility, I think, crisis for this, this building to actually happen. Um, and then I'm not sure overall uh, what what is gained in terms of compatibility. I feel like um, uh, that, that, that what would be gained there isn't, isn't a huge win for the historic district and makes so much more sense for the site for that garage to stay forward and feel a little bit more attached to the house. Um, so I, those were my two main comments. And again, I'm here to help um, with any questions and discussion points and um, just be part of helping this applicant um, meet the design guidelines and get to an approval. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Okay, um, we oh. go ahead, Claire. Is this going to be a, um, a care facility with the so many bedrooms and stuff? This is um, of the applicant. At this time, we are not considering this project in, in, for that usage. At this time, but do you um, anticipate that you might in the future? Uh, no, did not come to my attention. Okay. There was something about it in the staff report, I believe, Claire. What? There's something, uh, I'm trying to find it, but I believe there's something 
in the staff report about um, not having that in the actual application. Is it just, um, to me, it doesn't look like a, a single family resident. I mean, it's just the massing, and I think the massing is even more pronounced um, with it being situated next to the Guild Building, which is so um, low, um, has such a low ground hugging massing. But of course, the Guild Building would not be allowed to be built today. It was built before the regulations right. were even thought up. But right. You, you're absolutely right about the con contrast between them. Yeah, and so it really, um, you know, kind of adds more it, um, just because of the, um, just because of the, um, like it's adjacent, you know, to that building. And then, um, and then I have a question. I don't know if I should bring it up now, but I'm, I'm looking on page 13, the rendering streetscape drawing revised April 2020. I wanted to ask about the the detail. Do you have that? I'm looking for it a second. It's the sketching with all the with the landscaping on it. Um, is it the color rendering? On the, is the color rendering? Oh, well, I printed mine in black and white, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one still has the garage attached. Uh, the applicant's revised plans, page three, shows a similar drawing that shows it with the garage separated, not okay. attached, but separated. Right. But um, my question was, um, and I don't know if it's, uh, I guess I should hold on a second. Would this one help? Claire, is this, this is a 3D perspective. Is that helpful? That's based yeah, on that's the plans proposed. that's the one proposed. I was talking about. So that's the okay. Um, all right, then that answers my question because I was looking at the detailing under the under the dormer. So all right, I will put that one away and get to I'm sorry. H three. Okay. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Um, maybe for John. So the, I think one of the, the biggest, you know, points of change between the last meeting and this meeting is on that, the, the roof line, I guess, and the dormer and how that's situated. And you know, John's comments and his email um, were in regard to it being a little bit top heavy, uh, still. And I think, you know, when you compare it to the way the dormer and the roof line uh, are on the Washington Street uh, four square, um, that was in the, the presentation as being kind of the prototypical four square in, uh, in the district. Could you, I guess, maybe elaborate on that and, you know, the differences there and why you chose what you have here? Okay, so originally we had the full um, upper story, upper floor, uh, because really for residential, we, we had only two levels, uh, because as we know, this is a hybrid building. So uh, basically two levels for residential and less than 1,000 square feet for commercial space. Uh, however, when there was a concern about the, uh, the height of the building, then we lowered the roof and we cut the upper floor and currently these dormers um, we can see uh, only allow us to have uh, some uh, living space at eight feet ceiling um, and we've seen similar uh, designs um, in the neighborhood um, so that that shows kind of like a two and a half story 
of residential. However, again, um, I'd like to highlight this is not residential. Um, so commercial is the ground level. Um, and I don't know if this constitutes a, a full story because it's only uh, on the front of the building. Behind this, as we see, we have crawl space, so no living space on the ground level. So the living space or residential usage is only the main level in the attic. So we, we, um, we created this jogging roof situation uh, to allow the, uh, some usable space under the attic. As you can see on the floor plan, I mean, we can look at the floor plan of the attic space. You know, I don't know if I added that in. I didn't add all floor plans, but they're in the packet the, uh, of the revised plans attached to the agenda. Yeah, so it's very small um, usable space that the roof seems to be higher, but only at these dormers we can, as I said, utilize because the roof cutting cutting to the living space too much. So the, the dormers will allow us to use, however, the dormers is the width of the dormer, eight feet, and the, the right side is, is more 18, um, can't remember also without um, looking at the plans. But anyway, these dormers allow us to have eight foot ceiling at the attic space and have one bedroom, one bathroom, small kitchenette and uh, some li small living uh, at the attic. Okay. And we don't see much um, possibility to cut this. Otherwise, we are look the owner is not getting um, not in half of, of the anticipated to get from this lot. I don't know if this will help. Yes, yeah, so yeah. please answer my questions. Yeah, I guess. Or, or but we, we also squeeze the building. I, I mean, to provide the separation, the three feet from the garage, we squeeze the building and we eliminated some square footage on the back, as you see, um, because many of those buildings have been done may, maybe originally with, uh, with like more square style, four square style. And then over time, there were some additions, especially on the back of the buildings. Um, and in this neighborhood, we found at least like four or six homes with attached garages. Um, and we have the pictures we, we submitted to the staff as well. Uh, we, we can, I, I believe, show these pictures of the neighborhood with attached garage. However, this one, because of the concern, we provided a separation uh, from the building. Any more questions for me? If there are no more questions, then we thank you for your uh, comments. And I'll ask if there are any members of the public wanting to speak in favor or in opposition to this application. And if there are none, then I think we will close the public hearing and move to deliberation. And I'm I'm curious, Christina, on the uh, on the subject of massing. And I, I probably should have just gone up there and shot a picture of it. But there is a very large. I, I think it's an assisted living. It's, it's a boarding house looking place on JQ Adams at six. Kind of greenish in color. That's the Eagles Lodge, the Atkins, the uh, Hutchinson Hospital. Is that what you're asking about? That's at uh, six. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've only seen mm. it going by. I've never paid particular attention to it but I bring it up because it's a building of what I perceive as comparable mass to this one and only a block away. That is the old Hutchinson Hospital. Yeah, that sounds right. And I, I wish I had a, a picture of it, maybe a Google Street View. Um, we can get that for the record. Yeah, and 
So while we're because it okay. seems like it, it lends some uh, support for the notion of having a comparable sized building on this site. It's a uh, sixth and John Evans. It's only a one story building. <laughs> Is it, really? <laughs> it is, but it does have a basement. It's also a uh, well, it has a basement. To box it's like a daylight. Yeah. Well, Laura's it's looking. Like a daylight basement. Sure. Well, Laura's looking at it. We will need to. Uh, this is my technical answer. We will need to open the record really quickly to uh, add this information in. Uh, okay. She, and that's will, fine. While we Laura does it, yeah, she'll get there. Okay. Okay. Is that eleven oh four Sixth Street? Oh, it's not John Adams. It is. Hold on a second. I'm pulling up 1104 6th Street. Keep going. Uh, it's the hospital. 16th uh, John Adams? 1104 6th Street. Yeah. It could be that. I. Two blocks behind the Dairy Queen. Used to walk yep. by it every day, taking my kids to Easton. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. And then if you want to Laura take it onto the side elevation, that that's has the biggest massing. Yeah, that's the one I had in mind. Wow, I haven't been by there lately. It's been fixed up. Is that yes it has. Well again that that image is from June of two thousand sixteen. So I would kinda like to uh open the public record in order to get this added to the uh, record for this application. Mm -hmm. And we can close the public record and resume deliberations. <laughs> technical Sold difficulty. that house once. <laughs> <laughs> we're just having some technical difficulties. Just a second. Google is not wanting to. There we go. Can you explain that gutter? No. Yeah. No. It's at the corner. You need to be going down six. The direction. So while you do that, I have a comment about the separation of the garage on there. I think that visually what they've done does the job. You're pointing at something. Uh, my only concern about that was that at some point, somebody is going to build something in that gap. If you leave the gap open, who knows what's going to end up in there? Homeless people or something. And there's going to be a need to cover that opening with something. And in so doing, it could easily undo the visual effect of separating it. So I would look for a condition of approval that stipulates that no barrier can be put there that you can't see through. Like I would, I, I think that it could be done with steel fencing or, or something to leave the gap there, but give the security to the space. Make it not accessible. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can you say that again? I, I was in the middle of the Google search, but I didn't hear the first part. Yeah, I was talking about the space between the garage, uh, the gap that's mm. there. I envision a need for security reasons to close that off and would suggest that it be done with a uh, 
some kind of an open structure, a, a steel gate, a uh, just something that's, that doesn't constitute a solid wall in there, which would then reconnect the garage to the building. I want to make sure that it, it stays open visually. It's about a, a 15 foot depth. Three foot eight, I think. Yeah, and about 15 feet deep, give or take. So it's not as deep. Yeah. I don't know if it's as deep as you think. Well, no, but it's, it's, it's deep enough to become a security concern if, if, if it's just left wide open. I just, I, I just know that somebody's going to cover that opening with something, and I want to make sure when they do that that it's not an opaque closing off of the space. Mm. <laughs> Everybody's looking confused. I must not be. No, I, I hear you. Uh, no, I understand what you're saying, but. I'm kind of, you know, so my, my opinion on the garage, I guess, is that there's really no other feasible location for it on the site that has access. Um, it doesn't, it's not part of the main structure. Um, so it's not a integrated garage um, in, in that sense. Uh, it is set back from the front. You know, it's not overly ornate. Uh, it's relatively simple with, you know, two single doors. So I don't feel that it overly detracts from uh, the, you know, the, the design of the, of the home. Um, so I'm, I don't have much, I, yeah, I, I'm generally okay with it. Um, I actually don't, and I might be like, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of outsider here, but whether it actually touches the siding or not, I don't have a strong of opinion or not. You know, there's lots of a pattern of, you know, contributing structures in the district that have had garages added at some subsequent time that are not part of that main, you know, the main building or the main structure, but may touch or somehow be connected in one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, see that as a necessarily as a major detracting factor. You know, it doesn't that, um, you know, my only, my only concern with the gap is that it might look more awkward with kind of that weird gap there than if it actually touches. And, you know, if, if you can see back that, oh, well, it's actually just kind of a false thing. I'm, you know, my general opinion is, a, a way against things that are kind of fake or, um, you know, designed to trick the eye sort of thing. You know, if, if we're going to allow the garage, I'm fine with, you know, my inclination is just to allow it. Allow attached garage, you mean? Right. And one, yeah, you know, and, and I, I think that we can differentiate from it touching in the sense of it being attached versus a, you know, what I would call a snout garage that's, you know, on a ranch home that's integrated, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of that modern thing. I, I see them as different types of situations. But I'm, I, I'm open to the rest of the board's, you know, thoughts on that too. I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion on whether the gap should be there or not. Um, on the, shoot, I didn't print that. Conditions of approval. Uh, sorry, I, I went away from that page. Sure, I can put the conditions back up on the screen, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's okay. I found them now. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that part of the issue with the massing is exactly what Claire brought up and the 
contrast with the big, low 1960s style building next door. And there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but it is also larger than the buildings, like even across the street and stuff, you know? Yes, it is. But I'm trying to come up with a finding that describes a uh, a reason why this would be acceptable. And that's that's why I brought up that other building because yeah. it, it is a very large building. Uh, and kitty corner from that, there's a 1,200-square-foot house, so single-family house. Yeah. So it's a, it's a mixed neighborhood. It, it has some pretty bulky buildings. There's a historic building down at 5th and Monroe that is uh, fairly bulky i don't i don't remember what the square footage is but uh this isn't like kanima where there's a lot of thousand square foot places there there are more of the 2000 plus in this part of the neighborhood right yeah my my thoughts on that are um you know, I, I'm not as concerned with the Guild Mortgage building. Um, I, you know, I think anything that's there is going to have significant contrast between that type of design. It's more, to me, is more what's the impact on the residential, you know, properties that are across the street. Um, and then, you know, I, when you think about that, start thinking towards the comments on the lead work. And, you know, I read Christina's memo um, about how you might consider some of the design guidelines for commercial properties that might have commercial on the first floor and apartments above type situation, you know, but I think a building like that would probably be more, you know, jarring and, and less compatible with the residential um, properties across the street than a more a design that's more geared towards the residential design guidelines as opposed to the commercial. Um, so, you know, you, there's no necessarily perfect solution, but I, I tend to think that given the location steering towards the residential guidelines and picking that type of style is more appropriate than a, a large commercial building type style myself. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And then there's the uh, large commercial building on the uh, former drugstore site on 5th, 5th and Monroe. You mean 7th? Which, that's 7th, yeah, it's not 5th, yeah. 7th. Thank you. Uh, on the Olson drug site, which... Uh, I believe we approved that one, didn't we, Christina? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Uh, so this isn't about uh, keeping the neighborhood as it is. N neighborhoods change as the city develops. I see our charge is as making sure that when that development happens, that it doesn't detract from or distract from the uh, legitimate historical surroundings. So I do think we can integrate 
a larger structure in there. And, and I think that the world kind of insists that we do that. So in, in that regard, I'm inclined to say this is okay, in my personal opinion. With the garage attached as proposed? Um, yeah, it, it attached with the gap. I, I, I do like the little visual separation that he's stuck in there, the three foot, eight inch separation. I just don't want a homeless guy in there. You don't want a what? And <laughs> I, I don't want it to become a shelter for somebody walking up the street looking for a place to smoke a joint. <laughs> More comments? I agree with you on the, the, the Olsen drug property. That's what's been going through my mind tonight. So I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Ken. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I am as well. Um, I, I don't think, you know, there it's, it's, in, it's imperfect, but um, I think I, I can't exactly think of what I would want to change. You know, I, the applicants listened to our feedback, um, done the best with a very challenging site, and, um, you know, did, did a good job of trying to split the baby and, you know, build something that's compatible that still meets the needs of, of the applicant. And, uh, yeah. Well, it sounds to me like we're close to having a motion uh, if somebody would care to real express quick, one. Real quickly, Acting Chair Basinger, uh, my recommendation to staff is to revise condition of approval number six. Um, and it's not up there, so I'll read the whole one, and whole part, and then I'll tell you what's added. The existing says the applicant shall not use stamp, concrete, or vis visible gabion walls for any retaining walls, rockery, uh, real basalt, uh, veneer or smooth poured concrete are acceptable and this is added all retaining walls associated with the garage and left elevation shall be new, no more than six feet tall all of the retaining walls shall be no taller than four feet okay that's good any other conditions of approval that anybody wants to add How about a motion? For GLU 20-00005, HR 20-01. I'll move to approve application GLUA 20-00005, HR 2001 with the uh, conditions as discussed. I'll second that. Very good, thank you. Pull the board, please. All right, uh, HRB member Matt. Aye. HRB member Stobie. Aye. HRB member Blythe. Aye. Acting Chair Basinger. Aye. Motion carries. And with that, we send the applicant home to get to work. We thank you for your time and your work. Thank you. Item four on the agenda, communications. Uh, we're seeking a volunteer to lead Oregon City's comprehensive planning nomination for HRB representative. Thank you. So the, yeah, the city of Oregon City is moving forward to update our comprehensive plan. We last did it in 2004. I was here with the board in 2004. Claire actually may have been then on the board, but we, yeah. uh, the, with the 
Revi revising the comprehensive plan is kind of going to be in two phases. One is a community visioning phase where we're thinking bigger picture. Where does the city want to be? Where do they want to go? What do they love about Oregon City? What do they want to make sure doesn't change or does change? So bigger picture visions. And then that will get uh, folded into more technical analysis and, and revisions to the actual comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan in, in Oregon City and in, in all cities in Oregon is the guiding land use document for kind of all land use decisions uh, in the city. So uh, we want to have a kind of a 2020 version of the comprehensive plan that takes all the best uh, comprehensive plans from the region and learn from everyone's mistakes and everyone's uh, successes and try to write a document that has clear vision clear direction, good policies that the average person can open up and understand what the vision for our community is without being kind of weighed down with a lot of wonky talk. But uh, we do need to have a robust community outreach. So we have a lot of ways we're reaching out to the community. But as part of that, we are also creating more of a traditional project advisory team with lots of different backgrounds to bring to the table, both in the visioning phase and in the kind of writing the comprehensive plan phase. And historic preservation and a member of the historic review board is one of those identified positions. This group will meet over the next couple of years, uh, definitely this year with the first phase of visioning. Uh, to provide guidance on the documents that are that are created and direction, kind of how to move from the big picture uh, direction into actual policy. So we do need a representative from the Stork Review Board. And I'm going to pass it over to Laura Turway, a Community Development Director. She may have um, any additional comments that I may have missed about kind of your role on the project advisory team. Thank you very much, Laura Terway, Community Development Director for the city. Um, so this project advisory will meet up to 10 times between um, relatively soon and December 31st of 2021. So the whole span is about a year and a half long. And the advisory team, as Christina mentioned, will be with the project the whole time. They'll make uh, they'll be the guiding body to create the document. So they will take all these public comments and be the ones in charge and tasked with making sure that we're getting out a quick comment and that we are translating what we hear into a document that we all can support. So we're excited to have a seat specially dedicated to the historic review board. Um, we know that there are quite a few goals and policies related to um, historic um, nature of our community and um, requirements for design, the thing like that within our uh, chapter five of our comprehensive plan. And we're excited to continue this discussion. So this evening we'd like a, a nomination and a vote and that name will be forwarded on to Pete Walter, who's our project manager for the comprehensive plan. And Pete will provide all the details about next steps for that advisory team, mem team member. Now, assuming that uh, we want somebody who will actually be on the board throughout that period of time, I know I'm limited out at the end of this year and I won't be on the board next year. And I think Claire might be too, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I'm out of Because you and I started at the same time. Yeah. I think we should nominate John since he didn't come to the <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fair, but John limits out sooner than we do. Oh, he does? Mm -hmm. And it's not a requirement yeah. that you dedicate the whole time um, because it's a dedicated position to HRB. So if you can do part of the position and then you um, term out of HRB or something like that, that transition is okay. So we can pass the baton. Yeah, you can pass the baton to a new member if you term out. I think what Laura is saying. But it would be nice to have a continuum of somebody that's going to be there for the full, you know, for that full project. If you know what I mean. Limits us to two people. Yeah. <laughs> and it ain't us. How do you feel about that, Grant? Ray? Oh, I need this camera here. <laughs> Um, I mean, certainly I, it sounds interesting and I would like to contribute. Um, I don't, you know, what, 
What's, what's the time commitment like, Laura? I'm sighing if you can't hear that. Um, it's a little unclear at this time. I'm, you're gonna have to do prep for meetings and have up to 10 meetings. The Historic Review Board as a whole will act, also have time commitment dedicated to, the, uh, to this project. So on top of that, you can assume for each of the 10 meetings, maybe eight hours, including prep and the meeting itself. So about 80 at the most. I think that's a little conservative. Hopefully it will be less. Sure. Over a year and a half. Right, over a year and a half. I'm, I guess I'm open to it. Um, I nominate Grant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll second that. <laughs> he was a, he's, he's got a lot more experience and knowledge than I do. Yeah, Grant, if, if you feel like you can do that job, uh, I would certainly support that nomination as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with that. If uh, you guys are putting your trust in me, I suppose, and, and we'll see how it goes. And we will uh, and have- I'll back you up if you can't, you can't fulfill it, Grant. If you feel too much, let me know. I can definitely take over. I will remember you said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's on tape. It's on tape. <laughs> and I can see work sessions uh, with Kelly leading over this next year and a half on specific items when it gets close. Um, but we, it's all to be determined. Sure. Okay. Cool. So that, we've all agreed that's our nomination. Do we need to put that in the form of a motion and vote on it, Christina? I don't think so. You can do all, every, okay. you can do an aye vote if you want to. Aye. All in favor, aye. 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 All right. It's done. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for um, uh, putting up with me these last couple months while Kelly's been on maternity leave. But she'll be back as your Stork Review Board planner uh, it, for the June meeting if we have one or the next meeting we have. So, um, Do I was have just, anything on the docket? Not that I know of. So we should have a canceled June meeting, it sounds like, um, unless something comes out of. Uh, we have a lot of minutes, but that might be in a July meeting. Uh, so right now, I don't think we have anything noticed. Uh, we probably have a day or two just in case. But um, right now, with these two applications being approved, most likely the June meeting will be canceled. Okay. Cool. Uh, Christina, b before we adjourn here, can you stay, keep me online for just a few seconds after adjournment? Sure I have can. a separate question for you. Okay, I can do that. Thank you, Christina, for guiding us along while Kelly's been gone. As always. Yeah. It's kind of like old home week. You I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always here to help. Cool. All right. Thank Great. you all. Have a good evening. Yep. Well, I'm gonna go watch. I'm gonna go watch um, part two.